Welcome to our session on ensuring access to telehealth for individuals with low income. My name is Kathy Wiberly, and I am director of the Mid-Atlantic Telehealth Resource Center, and I will be moderating the session today. For those who may not be aware, Telehealth Resource Centers, or TRCs for short, are federally funded by HRSA to provide support and resources to expand the use of quality telehealth services. There are two national and 12 regional centers who serve the entire country, including the US affiliated territories, such as Puerto Rico and Guam. CRCs offer technical assistance, education, and training to healthcare providers and organizations to effectively implement telehealth solutions and to help with navigating regulatory and reimbursement landscapes to ensure compliance and financial viability. Additionally, TRCs work to increase public awareness and understanding of telehealth, enhancing accessibility and quality of healthcare services for diverse and underserved populations. To learn more about TRCs, you can visit telehealthresourcecenter.org. Joining me today are three esteemed panelists, Mary Oxner with Bay Rivers Telehealth Alliance, Joycelyn Lawrence with Jesse Trice Community Health System, and Anthony Roggio with the University of Maryland. Each presenter will have a set of slides followed by some question and answer time. And we will start with Mary. Thank you, Kathy. My name is Mary Oxner. I am the Executive Director of Bay Rivers Telehealth Alliance. And part of our alliance is also the Eastern Shore Telehealth Consortium. Uh, next slide. Our service region includes 12 counties in rural Virginia. Uh, that make up the Eastern Shore, Middle Peninsula, and Northern Neck. You can see them in the map. Um, I have circled them so you can get an idea of where we are located um, in the state of Virginia. Next slide. Bay Rivers Telehealth Alliance is a nonprofit membership organization. We started out of a grant with the regional AHEC in 2003 when several members of our community got together and said, we need an agency to focus on telehealth. And obviously back in 2003, that wasn't something that many people were doing. So we were awarded a rural health network development planning grant. And around 2007, Berta Bay Rivers Telehealth Alliance became incorporated and adopted the new name and got a full-time executive director to run um, the agency. In 2020, Berta added Eastern Shore Telehealth Consortium to focus on bringing telehealth to the Eastern Shore region. Next slide. A little bit of history on Eastern Shore Telehealth Consortium. It became part of Berta in 2020, working with uh, some different providers in that area, as well as since then, we have been awarded three grants to help bring telehealth-enabled services to that area. Next slide. This might be a little bit difficult to read, but this is just a grant timeline I wanted to include just in case anybody was interested. Once they received the PowerPoint, you can see some of the work that we've done, and you could always reach out to me if you have any um, questions or want to learn more about some of those specific grants. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, Bay Rivers is a little different. We are a membership organization. Our members pay dues to be part of our organization, and we write and manage the grants, and our members and partners do the direct care service. Here's just a list of our members, and in fact, there is 13 now. We had a new member, a federally qualified health center, join us since these have been released. You can see that some of our members have been with us since 2004 when we started, and of course, we can't do all of our work with just our members. We do need some partners. And uh, next slide, please. You can see here are some of the different partners in our region that have helped us on our different grants. Next slide, please. So to ensure telehealth access to low-income individuals, some of our projects that we're currently doing focus on utilizing free clinic and state health departments to um, have un uninsured individuals access services. We have a grant working with justice involved population, of course, our rural population in Virginia, and at risk youth and transitional teen population. Some of the overall challenges we have faced um, as working on these initiatives are with workforce, connectivity, 
patient engagement and digital literacy, which I'm sure many of you on this um, session today can echo how those challenges can impact your services. Next slide, please. So how we are reaching vulnerable populations with telehealth and looking at the uninsured population, we've been using some grant funds to cover Zoom licenses so that our smaller partners are able to have telehealth services out of their facilities and also covering salary cost. When we look at uh, what we are doing with a free clinic, our case manager has been able to engage 144 individuals using telehealth um, and helping them with social determinants of health. So helping them with referrals, accessing care, compliance, and uh, linking them to the things that they need in order to be successful with their treatment. The case manager has also been monitoring and engaging patients who present with behavioral health or substance use concerns, but they don't have a formal diagnosis. So this has been really key and success for this um, initiative we're doing with our grant, having this case manager be there to build rapport, identify needs, make referrals, and just really link this population to services that they might not otherwise be able to get because they don't have the formal diagnosis of behavioral health or substance use. And to date, they've been able to engage 493 unduplicated patients. We've also been working with um, telehealth coordinator. So this person's been able to coordinate and monitor 57 um, uninsured individuals in a free clinic to access telebehavioral health visits. So these individuals are able um, to come to the free clinic to have the equipment and the Wi-Fi that they need to access these telebehavioral health visits in order to see the treatment they, they require or they need. And we've been working with patient navigators to screen individuals who will need services um, to meet their needs. We estimate that this project has about a 50-50 split. So some of the intakes and screenings might be done in person. Some of them might be done via telehealth. Sometimes the, um, the patient might come in for a few telehealth visits, a few face-to-face -face visits, but really just being able to offer those through the free clinic has been able to increase the access for these individuals to telehealth, um, saving not only their time with travel and the clinic's time, but linking them to those specialty cares that are not available in their community. Next slide, please. We've been able to um, use telehealth to expand access points for medication-assisted treatment services. With one of our grants, we offered, uh, we opened three new access points in our service region offering face-to-face -face and uh, virtual options. But I just wanna note that all group counseling or all group style therapies are virtual. We've had 216 unique patients come in through um, the telehealth portion with about an 87% intake um, appointment show rate. So what that means is when uh, we have scheduled the assessment or the intake appointment, 87% of the time, they are coming on the day that it was screened and not having to reschedule. And I just think this speaks to having this available through telehealth for this population. There's been over 1600 appointments. And one of the things we're really proud of with this um, initiative is that we've had an 86% conversion rate. So from referral to treatment, there's been 86% have converted over. This initiative bringing the three new access points has about a 40-60 split for face-to-face -face versus telehealth. There are some treatments that require a face-to-face -face visit um, or intake, but for the most part, being able to expand medication-assisted treatment at these new access points with telehealth has brought the service to um, patients that would not otherwise be able to get it. Next slide, please. So if you'll see, uh, you can see in our data point here, the area that is circled, that is where the three new access points are actually physically located. 
And you can see from the color how much that has spread and people outside of the service region where the offices are physically located have been able to access services at those points um, using telehealth. So you can just kind of see that spread of how it goes across the um, our area in Virginia and the amount of people that are being able to reach um, these new access points because of telehealth. So next slide, please. And if you're just interested in little data on the access points, uh, it's a, a not quite a 50-50 split. There's actually more general, uh, more males that are accessing the services and the telehealth. And the average age is about that 31 to 40. We see that over 70% have Medicaid. So no, we know that we are reaching individuals that really do need the service. And for um, drug of choice with these uh, MAT access points, it's kind of most identify um, that heroin or alcohol are their primary drug of choice. So being able to offer them telehealth has um, really been able to help this type. This is just a great sample of what the average um, person accessing these points looks like. Next slide, please. One of the other um, populations that I spoke about is the justice involved population. So we have been able to engage 61 individuals in a regional jail, and this is face-to-face -face, um, in their re-entry program, which focuses on thinking for change, substance abuse, anger management, getting their GED, um, family reunification. And the reason I keep this in here, despite it being face-to-face, um, -face, is that has really built the rapport having uh, the peer recovery specialist in the facility has built the rapport with the um, justice involved population, allowing some of the um, individuals to transition or also access the telehealth service. So our peer recovery uh, specialist has been in there doing smart recovery program for 81 individuals in the, in the regional jail, focusing on addiction. And again, this has been done pretty face-to-face. -face. There has been some telehealth visits, especially during the COVID time. What this has extended is now 240 individuals have been able to access outpatient therapy virtually um, through the same regional jail. One of our partners had an existing mobile van, and what they do is the, um, the van actually drives to the regional jail, there is um, an individual on the van that will facilitate having the the um, justice-involved population come out of the building into the mobile van and access telehealth to their outpatient um, clinician, who is about an hour away from the facility. And the reason this has really worked is we know that some facilities, you, you can have internet, you can have the the access for it, but sometimes those connectivity issues happen when you get in certain types of buildings. And by having the mobile van outside of the building, they were able to have strong uh, virtual connections. Next slide, please. We've expanded telehealth in by connect by creating a partnership between our community service board and a local state health department to do behavioral health integrated and primary care setting. So we have a licensed therapist um, who spends three days a week providing telehealth. And some of this could be outpatient therapy. It could be case management. It um, could be monitoring, screenings. And then the uh, licensed therapist splits the other two days of the week by having a face-to-face -face, um, on-site one um, at each of the health departments during the week. The licensed therapist has been able to engage 130 uh, clients in over 2,600 visits by having this telehealth option at the local health department. Next slide. The other uh, project that we have for engaging um, access to low-income individuals is looking at our at-risk teens and transitional youth. 
We have a school-based grant that provides virtual um, behavioral health and substance use treatment to the middle schoolers and high schoolers while they are at school. So what we did with this uh, grant is we completed some school needs assessments with the different county public schools that are part of the program to really ensure access to telehealth can be school-based. What did they need as far as equipment, connectivity, and um, services and support in order to be able to have telehealth within the schools? And what we found was having a school site coordinator that is part of our agency or part of our members agency that is providing the direct treatment be available to go to the schools to facilitate um, the telehealth. So they're the person that would be able to get the student out of class, take them to the room where the telehealth equipment is and link them um, to their outpatient clinician or um, whoever the provider is. We found that being able to really implement this type of service, uh, the schools sometimes don't have the staff or the staff get pulled away for a different focus. So they weren't able to be um, engaged enough to have to go get the students and bring them into um, the sessions. We've identified, the schools have identified that vaping, mental health, and substance use are some key areas for this population. And so we've been able to develop outpatient therapy and what we call focus groups uh, to engage this population. In year one, we were in, able to engage 23 youth in sessions and have three telehealth focused um, sessions using an evidence-based curriculum that's focused on vaping. And we were really excited that we were able to extend these telehealth focus groups over the summer so that students can meet um, for 10 sessions and it's done twice a week uh, with the provider to talk about um, some of the using this evidence-based curriculum that's actually focused on uh, vaping and, um, excuse me, and marijuana use. So we were um, happy that telehealth has been able to really help that initiative. Next slide, please. So um, that brings me to the end of my presentation. I'll turn it back to Kathy to see if I have any questions. Yes, thank you so much. And just a reminder to put your questions in the Q&A box if you do have some. We do have two here for Mary and about three minutes for questions. So first question is patients who do not have access to computers, are these donated to them in order to obtain telehealth services? Uh, no, we currently do not have any grants that are donating um, any equipment to patients, but we do have the equipment that is available to at our partner's sites that they could use. And most patients that are accessing it sometimes are doing it on their on their telephone um, or a, a laptop or like tablet. All right, great, thank you. Um, what training or certifications are required for mobile van drivers or direct care staff for the telehealth for the re-entry re program? Okay, so the, uh, the, for the driver, was that specifically what they asked, Kathy? Okay. Um, both the drivers and the direct care staff who are on the van. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the driver does go through um, a lot of training. Um, he's actually a mental health uh, first aid trainer, and they go through revive training. Um, they are also put through um, trainings that are focused uh, from that agency on suicide risk and um, motivational interviewing, community, you know, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. So all their staff are open to an array of different training opportunities. From Berta's perspective, we do offer um, the staff that are part of these trainings, um, telehealth trainings. We offer them a foundations and telehealth course. If there are a licensed uh, clinician or clinician eligible, we have offered um, to cover the cost for them to become board certified telemental health providers. Uh, but there, and we've offered telehealth training to our partners specific to their needs. There's actually been some telehealth training around uh, implementing a diabetes program as well. But we really tailor it to the grant and what the individuals are doing. And we use grant funds to provide those trainings. 
All right, thank you. And that's a lot of training to, yes, to uh, yeah. get through. <laughs> Next question, for the sake of clarity, what label or name do you give to the school staff accompanying the students to their encounters? School site coordinator. That is the, um, their official title. All right. Um, next question. I'm sorry I logged in late. Did you see a higher compliance via telehealth versus clinic visits? Um, I don't have that data in front of me. What we do see when, especially at the access points, because we are tracking that and it's about a 40-60 split, is that we are seeing the ones that are doing telehealth visits do tend to keep their appointments more often and are attending that way. And like I said, all of the, for that specific grant project, all of the uh, groups that they attend, whether it's, um, you know, a veterans group or a, um, trying to the outpatient group, you know, they kind of divide them by topic. They're all virtual. So we are seeing that they're attending those more often. All right. For the sake of time, we're going to mm -hmm. need to move on. There are three more questions in the queue. And if we have time at the very end, we can come back to those. Thank so you. next up is Joycelyn Lawrence, and thank you, Mary. All right, good afternoon, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm Joyce Lawrence, the Chief Medical Officer for Jesse Trice Community Health System. I've been with the organization for about eight and a half years. On the next slide, just to give you a little bit of background information about Jetsy Trice, we were the first federally qualified health center in the state of Florida. Our sites are in, spread out over Miami. Unlike many of you, I'm pretty sure, um, or, or like many of you, I'm sure that we share a similar mission, and that's in providing health care and equity um, to all. So Jesse Trice owns and operates 14 practice sites. Um, we also have a 40-bed women's residential center for substance use. We have a presence within the university and also within 44 school-based health sites. We're a very culturally diverse organization, uh, being in Miami, of course. We are joint commission for medical, behavioral health, and our dental components. Next slide. In looking, taking a closer look at our customers served, we identified the top three social determinants of health amongst our patients. And this was determined by using the PREPARE screening form. That's the protocol for responding to and assessing patients' assets, risk, and experiences. So from this tool that we try to deliver to every patient being seen at Jesse Trice, our top three social determinants of health identified are one, financial strain, second, stress and anxiety, and third, which caught most of us by surprise, was social isolation. We certainly expected that during the time of COVID, but now post-COVID, that's still amongst our top three. About 45% of our patients report living below, at or below the federal poverty level. Our patients have, are run high for chronic conditions such as hypertension and diabetes. Our Miami site um, has one of the oldest public housing facilities in the nation. In fact, it's undergoing redevelopment and gentrification as we speak. Um, some of our sites are also located within the number one zip code areas for emergency room visits for children and also number one zip code for incidents of HIV cases. Next slide. So with our funding from HRSA, our optimizing virtual care funding, uh, we wanted to refine what we do with telehealth. So we refined our telehealth team to include not only myself, but a telehealth director, coordinator, remote patient monitors, of course, our providers, peer mentors who were crucial to the the project, and we included our patients in the, the planning of this. And we wanted to make sure that we did that so that our patients would be able to connect um, utilizing our remote patient monitor and peer mentor. They would touch base with our patients, making sure they were could connect and were ready to connect. Next slide. 
We formalized our workflow by incorporating telehealth into our decision tree that patients encounter when they're calling for appointments. The tree took them through a series of yes or no questions to make sure they got the right type of appointment based upon their needs. So for instance, if they stated that their need was a vaccine, then telehealth would no longer be an option that was viable to them. And we did this for each specialty within Jesse Trace. Next slide. We then, tele we then formalized our workflow for doing the actual telehealth encounter. And we did this in a way to minimize patient time spent interacting with various staff from the front desk to nursing staff and to the provider. There was also an option for patients to complete a satisfaction survey upon closure of their encounter. Next slide. There were multiple components to our OVC grant. Um, one was basic telehealth services, but we expanded that into a senior high school within the university and also within our women's residential treatment facility. And I have to say that with those three sites, what we considered our non-traditional sites, there was a 30% increase use in telehealth in comparison to the organization. We incorporated remote patient monitoring for our hypertension and diabetes patients. Again, our peer mentor and monitors reviewed readings daily and connected them to their providers if their readings um, exceeded certain levels. And I have to say that our patients that participated in this, 60% of them, I'm sorry, 70% of them gained control of their hypertension and diabetes. And this is in comparison to 60% across the organization. One of our favorite components was the use of medical students as patient navigators. They met with uh, our diabetic patients who were out of control. Um, each was assigned to a patient um, and they were monitored by a telehealth over the course of the project. And out of 26 patients um, that were uncontrolled by project N, 24 had gained full control. We also utilized a Unite Us platform. It's a social service platform that's bridged to medical care. So any patients that were identified with adverse social determinants of health, whether it be a need for food, legal services, needing jobs, we were able to refer them in this platform and we could communicate with the community-based organizations such as the American Heart Association or the YMCA for whatever that patient's need was. And we were able to see um, when that patient had received the service. And then finally, we also developed and implemented a telehealth curriculum, which included dental and optometry components. We utilize this curriculum for new providers coming on board, and we also utilize it with our rotating medical students so that they're introduced to our platforms. This uh, curriculum also is available for CME credit to our providers. On the next slide, we incorporated um, information into our electronic health record, which would prompt providers to know when patients were enrolled into the remote monitoring platform or certain types of telehealth. Next slide. And just to give you an idea of some of the equipment, some devices um, we were able to give to patients that paired with their smartphones. Um, and that allowed for transmission of heart and lung sounds and also otoscope exams. We also, um, later in the game, um, implemented the retina view camera, which could provide dilated images of, of patients' um, eyes. And this was especially crucial for our uninsured patients who could not afford a full-scale um, exam. Our optometrists, of course, would follow up with any abnormal readings. Next slide. So again, some of the accomplishments through our program that we were able to demonstrate improved measures. Um, through HRSA, we were, um, gained recognition, a community health quality recognition badges for addressing social risk factors and increasing access to health. 
And we also gained some momentum um, with other partners. Next slide. If we could do it over again, we would include additional members to our team, like a health educator, um, recognizing also that certain patients prefer the continuous glucose monitors over the glucometers. And next slide. We believe that our future in telehealth remains pretty bright. Um, we are in the process of partnering with someone who's incorporating a telehealth module, modular units within the new development that's going on within um, one of our areas. And we're also incorporating telehealth on demand and continuing to monitor um, the landscape of telehealth here in, in Florida, especially for Miami. And I believe that include, concludes um, our presentation. If there are any questions. Thank you so much, Ms. Lynn. Um, we do have some questions for you and we might actually have some time to go back to some of the unanswered, unanswered questions. So first question for you is, can you speak to your no-show rates for telehealth visits and how do you structure clinician schedules to maximize their time? Yes, we carved out designated time for telehealth for our providers. Our no-show rate was typically 30%, sometimes even higher. But for telehealth, the no-show rates are not as high. And one of the things that we did um, for patients that had in-person appointments, if they were not to show, we do reach out to try and convert that to a telehealth appointment. And that has worked as well. And then the second part of that question is, how do you structure your clinician schedules? to maximize their time? I know you said something about blocking out some time, but I don't know if there's some more you wanna say about that. Yeah, so some of our providers have certain days or certain half days that are devoted towards telehealth. Um, and within the provider's template are designated telehealth slots as well. And those can be converted back and forth from in-person to telehealth. Great, thank you. Next question is, how are you maintaining the resources list and referrals for the social determinants of health? And, and are you tracking follow-up and outcomes on referrals? Yes, so our electronic health record um, tracks and can provide data as, in terms of patient responses to the social determinants of health. Also, the Unite Us platform is currently being embedded within our EHR, but even before that, um, we are able to pull reports directly from the platform itself. Great, thank you. Next question. Um, did I understand you have optometrists interpreting data from retina exams? Has anyone ever evaluated their accuracy in performing such services as compared with that of ophthalmologists? Yes, well, being that we just implemented, but that is a very good question. We just implemented this. Um, so that certainly does present a possibility for something uh, for us. The images are transmitted externally to ophthalmologists for reading as well. And then in-house, our optometrists will follow up with the abnormal readings and then refer out um, as need be. That's great. Another question. Can you expand on the continuous versus Bluetooth monitor comment? Why the preference? Did most patients have connection, bring your own device smartphones, or did you help them get those connections? Yes, for patients that did not have smartphones, if they met certain criteria, we would provide those cell phones to them. Um, that was not a part of this grant. That was through a separate partnership. Um, in terms of the continuous glucose monitors versus the Bluetooth-enabled glucometers, it was just a matter of a, a need for less finger sticks. Um, with the glucometer, obviously, there's daily monitoring finger sticks that need to be done with the continuous monitor that mm -hmm. did not need to be done. So yes, our patients did prefer that. All right, next question. Mm -hmm. I am very interested in learning about the Unitas platform. We use the prepare screeners with subsequent resourcing for our organization in an effort close to close gaps. Does this assist in resourcing? Yes, the Unite Us platform, they are an organization um, throughout the U.S., um, obviously with concentration in certain areas because of the extensiveness of it. 
but they have a pretty strong presence within Miami. And to my understanding, um, they were available at no cost to other FQHCs. And what All I right, especially that, like about the okay. platform is if you're working with a community-based organization that's not currently on the platform, they would work with that organization to include them. Great. Next question. What are your retention challenges for healthcare center staff and providers, and how is telehealth and related technology impacting retention? The retention is obviously, especially for nursing, it, it's very difficult. Um, and that's across the board, not just with nursing, but for providers. I think telehealth provided an option um, in terms of the work lifestyle balance. I think that it did help tremendously with that. Great. All right, next question. With title care, do you have many physicians who utilize that with asynchronous care? Um, the patient's recording the exam, sending it in, and physician reviewing at a later time. And then how is reimbursement with that? Okay, I don't think I caught the first part of your question. So the question is actually related to title care, but I'm not sure that it completely fits. Um, so it says, do you have many physicians who utilize that with asynchronous care? So that would be the patient recording the exam and sending it to the patient to review at a later time. Sure. So with the title care, that's for synchronous only. Um, I do know that there are some platforms available utilizing tele title care in an asynchronous fashion. However, we're not using it in that capacity. With the retina view, um, that is asynchronous um, for the optometry exam. And yes, that is completely re reimbursable. And can you expand on your referrals from medical to dental and other service lines? So with our referrals, um, we, we believe in an integrated approach to care. Um, so we will often refer from strictly directly from the provider's exam room table into the dental chair. And also we will do the exact same thing with behavioral health. And we did that a lot during COVID, especially um, where patients were able to go from one service to the other via telehealth. Excellent. All right. Um, this question was originally for Mary, but I think both of you can probably answer this one. Um, have you encountered telehealth service rejection because of religious concerns? I have not, but that's a great question. And if we have, the patients did not make it known to us. <laughs> I was going to just echo that and say, I personally have not heard of the rejection um, for religious concerns. I'm sure that it is out there, but it's not been voiced to us. And the other question that was for Mary, but both of you can definitely answer this as well. What qualifications or training do nurses need to become telehealth providers and where can nurses seek employment? <laughs> I don't know if Mary wanted to go first, but um, <laughs> we offer our telehealth um, trainings across the board, not just for our providers, but nurses are um, will receive a training as well. And that is very similar. We offer the same telehealth training per, for all providers, but you know there are telehealth certifications out there um, that are specific to different workforce, like the board certified telemental health for licensed clinicians. So. Um, I'm sure there are ones out there that if uh, you look into it are specific to nurses. All right, thank you so much. And we will go from here to Anthony. Thank you very much, Kathy. So hello everyone, my name is Anthony Rojo. I'm medical director of telehealth for the University of Maryland Medical System. And to discuss our work on improving access to healthcare resources via telehealth, for underserved and low-income individuals, we're gonna be discussing our Maryland telehealth expansion into the Maryland Eastern Shore. Uh, next slide. So for background, the University of Maryland Medical System is a system of 10 hospitals, uh, five freestanding emergency departments, our UM urgent care network, and over 100 outpatient clinics that are operated by our UM physician network. The system is responsible for about 1.2 million outpatient visits every year, or uh, about 100,000 hospital admissions every year. Next slide. 
and the Eastern Shore uh, is just north of what Mary was talking about in Maryland. Uh, it's an area that lies east of the Chesapeake Bay and west of the Atlantic. Uh, includes a total of nine counties, which we focused on five uh, for, our, for our studies, and has a population of about 450,000 people over about 990 square miles. Uh, University of Maryland has two hospitals and two freestanding emergency departments in the area. They're marked on the map here. Uh, and across the whole area, we get about 66,000 emergency department visits which seems really high, especially for a rural population, right? So just keep that in the back of your mind as we kind of discuss the next few slides. So next slide. Uh, in terms of demographics, this area is about a third of the state's land mass, but only has about 8% of Maryland's total population. Eight to 15% of individuals live below the poverty line. Uh, that's about one and a half times the national average in our highest counties. Uh, and that depends on the county you're looking at. Uh, unemployment is relatively high as well, between 5 and 11 percent, anywhere from uh, at the national average to about three times the national average. Uh, Eight percent of patients on the shore are uninsured, and 15 percent have Medicaid coverage only. And then in terms of education level, uh, we're looking at lower levels of high school graduation rates compared to the rest of the state and, and the U.S. average as a whole. Uh, and similarly, the number of individuals who receive associates or bachelor's degrees are also falling behind the rest of the state and nation. Next slide. So given the demographics of the area and the understanding that there's likely a gap in healthcare uh, compared to the other areas of the state, UMS Community Health Improvement Committee organized with community leaders, the public, health experts, and, and five of the county health departments that serve the Midshore. And together they developed the Community Health Needs Assessment and Implementation Plan and identified the three most important health problems that affected the community and the top barriers to healthcare. So as you can see, Alcohol and drug addiction, obesity, and mental health were some clear gaps for the area. And the barriers here mainly reflected costs of care and lack of access due to not having necessary providers or a lack of transportation to get to those providers, as you would expect in a widely spaced low income community. Next slide. And overall, compared to just a few years prior when the counties did a similar assessment about five years earlier, it didn't seem that much had changed. Um, we didn't really address the gaps that, that were identified even back in 2015. Um, there were similar concerns about healthcare access and affordability, much of the same when it came to health concerns. Um, so what did this mean for a population who needed care but didn't have access? Well, next slide. They were flooding the emergency departments and the emergency departments were getting crushed. So if you remember, I said we have over 66,000 patients per year across our four rural EDs. Uh, so the EDs were just, just getting floored. So we developed a plan uh, and received a HRSA grant to bring telehealth services to our patients to try to limit the damage to our overburdened emergency departments. And we built a telehealth emergency department network program that's based on uh, the success of five goals. Reducing interfacility transfers, providing better patient care in place, improving our patient care outcomes by prioritizing tertiary care for the sickest patients, improving access to care, and minimizing costs. Next slide. And, and these goals and solutions associated with them were specifically created to directly correlate to the barriers and the healthcare needs that we had discussed earlier. So we created four arms for our program. Next slide. The first arm is tele-EMS pre-hospital. This is a program designed to prevent unnecessary ED utilization and free up EMS services sooner by treating patients in place with telehealth. We developed protocols with the Maryland Institute for Emergency Medicine uh, Service Systems to consult ED physicians for very low acuity patients uh, who called 911 and be able to see them through telehealth equipment loaded onto the ambulances. The patients get a full history and physical, have access to the same ED services, but just at a distance. They get their exam done in coordination with, with a paramedic on the scene, and they can get their prescription sent and follow up arranged for them in real time. Um, we're just starting this program up now, so we'll see how successful it is, but I'm pretty optimistic this is gonna improve access to care for many of our patients for whom access and transportation to the hospital was one of the biggest barriers. Um, it also decreases the overall cost of care since you're not getting the ambulance transportation costs and there's no facility fees associated with the encounter uh, that you would typically get with a high cost ER visit. So I'm anticipating this is gonna be very successful. Next slide. The next arm of our tele-EMS acute, pro uh, sorry, of our program is the tele-EMS acute program. And this is an adjudication platform for interfacility transfers. A lot of the patients who are on the shore re require a higher level of care, um, but the distance between the shore 
emergency departments or the shore hospitals to the tertiary care center that we have over at the main campus of University of Maryland is about 60 miles. Uh, on top of that, depending on the bridge, it can take over an hour and a half to get there back and forth via ambulance. So when patients uh, from the shore or, or really any hospital require a consultation service or a higher level of care that's not available at their site, typically what they do is they'll call our University of Maryland Access Center. Uh, it's called by the ED or the hospitalist group at the, at the shore facility, and then we facilitate a transfer for that patient. What we found, though, is that a lot of those patients were being unnecessarily inconvenienced and traveling those, you know, 120 miles back and forth to get the care, uh, when often a simple consultation that was done with a phone or audio video connection uh, and our chart review was really all they needed. So what we did is we tapped into our access center physician program. This is an emergency medicine or critical care trained physician who listens to transfer requests and whose job it is to get the patient to the right care at the right time in the right place. I'm sure you've all heard that phrase before. Um, sometimes it's a transfer and facilitating the fastest way to make that transfer happen, but often it's treating the patient in place and navigating the nuances of that, uh, and that's what the access center physicians were empowered to do under our, under our program. Uh, they intervene on calls. They coordinate with the sending and receiving providers to identify any alternatives to transfer and really bring the specialty care to the patient instead of bringing the patient to the care. Next slide. Our third arm is our teleaddiction program. So as we said, um, addiction was one of the major health concerns on the shore. And when we did our needs assessment, especially in our lower income population. So Dr. Weintraub, who's my co-I for our project and director of addiction services at University of Maryland, brought his expertise of his department into the ERs with telehealth consultations. So for any overdose or substance use disorder patient who's receptive to treatment, our ED docs are able to put a consult order in directly to his service, Dr. Weintraub's service, and they see the patient remotely and bridge them to the next step of care. Um, alternatively, these patients would have had to have traveled significant distances to get to the Department of Health over at Easton, which is one of the only sites on the shore uh, that can actually deliver bridge treatment. So this is, again, a time, transportation, and expense saver uh, for our patients and for our help for our physicians as well who are overburdened. Next slide. Um, the last arm of our program was our ED telesurge work. Uh, this program was built off of our teletriage process that came out of uh, COVID, but is a, basically an alternative to surge staffing. Part of a rural emergency medicine service is lots of high variability between EDs and, and visits and not knowing how many patients are going to walk through the door at any given time. Um, in those cases, staffing becomes an issue, and oftentimes you'll have to call in staff from home, usually at a higher rate of pay, to get more docs in the room to see a sudden influx of patients, if those docs are even available. So what we figured out is instead of having physicians come in, we can have physicians see patients with telehealth, um, either while they're at home or even when they're working at one of our other kind of lower volume or lower volume at the time, non-surging uh, shore emergency departments. And the goal of this was, you know, one, to decrease the cost of surge staffing, but more importantly, reduce our left without being seen rates during these high surge times and reduce our door to physician times, uh, of which Maryland has some of the worst, I think possibly the worst uh, times in the nation. Next slide. So looking at the results of all of our programs over the last three years, um, you can see utilization for each of them has steadily increased. Uh, much of this is thanks to the guidance of HRSA, our HRSA analyst, Carlos Mena, and the advice given by our technical assistance coordinator, Laurel Simmons. Next slide. And on a arm by arm uh, kind of sub view of this program, looking at telling that specifically since initiation uh, and through our third year of the HRSA collaboration, our access center physicians intervened on about 940 patients uh, with an average avoided transfer rate of about 20%. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so that counts avoided transfers or uh, transfers where patients were able to get a consult. So that's almost 200 patients that were able to successfully be treated in place because the program was available. Next slide. And then looking into the data even more, uh, the single most likely tell of whether a patient can avoid a costly and unnecessary transfer uh, based on the data that we have is whether the access center physician was involved in the care uh, and able to get them better care where they were. Um, so you can see we also had some great data work, and that's all due to our in-house data wizard, Dr. Mark Sutherland. Uh, you can click forward and see his picture. Uh, I'm proud to say he's another ER doc, uh, just like myself, and he was the Access Center Medical uh, Director for the first three years of the program. Next. 
There's there's Dr. Sutherland, who's, and he's our data wizard and the wizard of the Access Center in general. So we're very proud of him. Next slide. Um, in terms of teleaddiction, uh, our consultation rate from the emergency departments were relatively low. Not very many patients were interested in trying to get a bridge to care, unfortunately. Um, but of those that were, so 15% were referred, um, all of them were successfully referred to treatment by Dr. Weintraub's group. Um, and this was of all the patients who came in with overdose and uh, substance use disorder or opiate use disorder as, as diagnoses. Next slide. And then lastly, for our telesurge operations, on top of being able to reduce our door to provider times by almost half on average when telesurge was utilized, um, sometimes even up to 90% on certain days in the ER, our left without being seen rates during the period dropped significantly, uh, almost by about two and a half percent. And this obviously increased our access to services for our ED population of patients who were seeking care for, for various complaints. Um, in terms of cost of care, uh, our surge pool utilization also dropped. Uh, we were able to save about $80,000 a year in extra costs for the department. So again, improving access, improving our services, uh, improving our quality of care by decreasing door to provider times and preventing patient deteriorations and then reducing the cost of care at the same time. So win, win, win in all departments. Next slide. Uh, and finally, one of the points to make is that helping people also helps the environment. So we had a significant environmental impact with all these programs, uh, saving about almost uh, 17,000 transportation miles for patients or about 28.5 uh, tons of CO2 emissions over the first three years of the program. So really great success there too. Next. Um, but I would argue that more important than all of that are the patient stories of those who were able to access better quality care. I included quite a few of them here. I'm not going to read through them all, but this list on this page and the next is just a snapshot of some of the improved physicians or improved experiences our physicians were able to accomplish for our patients uh, over on the Eastern Shore. And this is just over a single month of data. We get a report every single day of what the Access Center has done in the Access Center Physicians where they kind of free text all the help that they've been able to provide. Um, and, and this was just, I think, an awesome way to show the patient stories inside of this as well, because really we're affecting them the most. Next slide. And, and next slide. It's more for people who are getting the slides uh, after the, the visit. Um, so just in terms of the UMS approach at University of Maryland, this is that patient-centered care is what we strive for. And all of our telehealth and digital healthcare interactions, we want to keep the patient at that center of the equation because first and foremost, of course, we're in medicine to help people. That's always our number one goal. But even if you're looking at this from a strictly business standpoint, I mean, we're also in a consumer driven field and, and they're the ones setting expectations for us, regardless of their own financial circumstances or ability to access care in the traditional ways. We have to meet patients where they are because we need to prioritize care for patients who have significant barriers to access. Uh, whether those barriers are financial, societal, institutional barriers, bridging those gaps means better care and better outcomes for patients. And that's what we want for all of our patients in our telehealth programs. Next slide. So looking towards the future, uh, we're trying to make telehealth an integrated part of the patient care experience in both the inpatient and outpatient world uh, with those goals in mind. This is our UM uh, Aberdeen campus, which is in Northern Maryland. It houses a very, uh, similar population that, to the Eastern Shore in terms of demographics. Uh, our new facility there includes an observation unit and freestanding ED uh, that has built-in telehealth equipment in every single patient room that uses our in-house teleport uh, or telehealth platform, which is called UMS Teleport. You can go to the next slide. Um, and the goal of this is all to pilot driving telehealth as an integrated part of uh, every and any patient's care, allow them to receive that same high quality consultant and provider experience, and even nursing experience, regardless of their location within our network, um, keeping that idea of patient-centered care at the forefront of our mission. Next slide. Um, so that's it for me. I wanna thank everyone uh, for allowing me to present to you guys today. And uh, I have my email there if there's any questions uh, after the, the Q&A today. Thank you so much. I have a Thank couple you. of questions. One that is going to be applicable to all three of you. So I'm going to hold that to the end. Um, so for Anthony, are there a different set of protocols those EMS services are working under? Expanded scope of practice with applicable additional training? So there is additional training for the counties that we are working with. Um, they've each gone through uh, what we call teleport training or and telehealth training. Um, basically, it's 
a, a module that we've created for them uh, and that's distributed through the five counties that we're working with um, where they learn number one, how to use the telehealth equipment, but number two, how to successfully present a patient uh, to the emergency department and access those services. Um, the general set of protocols is luckily consistent throughout all of Maryland. Um, the Maryland Institute for Emergency Medicine Service Systems sets those protocols every year. Um, this is just additional training on top of those standardized protocols that we created for these five uh, counties as part of the pilot program. All right, next question is related. Is it still the case that government healthcare programs will not pay for transports unless the patient is taken to an ED? If so, does that mean that without your grants, you would have no means of utilizing your pre-hospital tele-EMS? So it is true uh, that there is no payment for transportation not to the ED, unless you were lucky to get into that ET3 program that was available for some time. Um, that said, uh, the grant is, is not paying for any, aside from the equipment, is not paying for any extra money for the EMS uh, ambulances. Um, they have all agreed that it's worth it to spend an extra five to 10 minutes with the patient doing this, then spend the 40 to 45 minutes it takes to get to the emergency department and offload the patient, um, you know, where they're maybe waiting another 20 to 30 to sometimes an hour and a half to actually get that patient off their stretcher, and then another half an hour back to their department. Um, the time saved lets them see other people who have more need for their services. And um, even though they're, they may be losing someone, you know, a transport initially, they're able to pick someone else up instead. So they don't see it as a big loss. All right, next question. I love the concept of bringing specialist care to the patient rather than bringing the patient to the specialist. In that model though, has any increased medical legal liability come up when adverse outcomes occur? It's a good question. And we had to obviously run all these uh, ideas through risk and legal, right? Um, they were actually very much on board because the alternative is keeping the patient in place for days and days and days, waiting for a bed to open up um, when we don't have that bed available within our, our hospital. Um, that's just the reality of, of medicine as it is right now, especially in the state of Maryland, there are just no beds anywhere. Um, the patients, sometimes the only way to get care is via telehealth. And that's better than, than no care, um, in, in, at least in our legal and risks uh, mind. And, and I tend to agree with them. Um, when it comes to whether or not the patient actually does have a poor outcome or worse outcome with telehealth, we haven't found that yet. Um, I haven't seen any data, at least within our system, supporting that. But I imagine that when that case does happen, I'm sure I'm going to get an email at my desk saying, hey, what's going on? <laughs> And is there teleport equipment on all EMS vehicles? There is uh, over on the Eastern Shore uh, within the counties that we work with. All right. Our final question applies to all of you. Taking into account, we are learning the different programs you have all established regarding telehealth services, mainly for underserved, uninsured, mainly Medicaid patients. As a fully bilingual primary care provider in Puerto Rico, are there any specific requirements any of your programs have for providers like me to aid in your efforts remotely from U.S. territories? Hmm. That's interesting. Um, if I can take a first crack at it, the the requirements that I know are in order to practice medicine, at least in the state of Maryland, you have to be licensed in the state of Maryland, right? So I think that's true of most states having some sort of licensure requirement, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, on top of that, uh, since you're in a U.S. territory, I, I don't know the answer to this question. Maybe, Kathy, you can answer it better. Is there any issue with CMS and reimbursement? I know you can't bill CMS or charge CMS when you're, inter, uh, when, when you're out of the country, um, but if they're from a U.S. territory, I imagine you can still do that. Do you know? Yeah, there are some nuances to that. In, um... From Puerto Rico, I would contact the Southeast Telehealth Resource Center, which serves Puerto Rico, and they should be able to address your questions. Anyone else want to take a crack at that? My answer was to refer them to their telehealth center for their region. <laughs> so you did exactly what I was going to do, Kathy. All right. Well, we are officially out of time. So I just want to thank you guys for all the presentations, um, great wealth of information. 
We are about to take a lunch break and we reconvene for our next session at 1.15. So thank you all. <laughs>